I've been teaching family law now for about 10 years. I started teaching law in 2002. And when I began teaching, this was what the United States looked like in terms of same-sex marriage. The white states are the states that did not have it. <laughs> <laughs> and the purple states are the states that did, and you'll see there are no purple states. So fast forward to 2014, and that's what we look like. I think something may have happened in the last hour. Um, but last time I checked, we had 32 states plus Washington, D.C., and there were a few more states who were still working things out internally and will probably uh, have marriage available in the next few days, such as Kansas. Uh, I, I chose this topic. I wanted to talk to you about the changes in law that have happened surrounding marriage equality uh, to give you a sense of what it's been like to be a family law professor during this really exciting time. I, I walk into class frequently wondering if something has happened in the news that I don't know about. And then as Sadler mentioned, uh, last night at the uh, dinner, I discovered that the Sixth Circuit had decided to uh, be the first circuit since the Windsor decision to uphold bans on same-sex marriage in four states. Uh, so this gives you a kind of real-life empathy experience and understanding what it's like to teach a subject like this when you never know when you're suddenly going to have to change uh, the focus of your remarks. Um, I want to talk about three things today that I think were the, th the three most important aspects of the cases and give you a kind of inside view of what arguments courts were, were looking at and how the arguments that litigants have made in these cases have changed. So there were three what I call here flashpoints in same-sex marriage litigation that emerged over the last decade. Um, the first is, is same-sex marriage a fundamental right? And for those of you who took constitutional law a long time ago, uh, just a reminder that the significance of a fundamental right is that if a fundamental right is at issue in one of these cases, then the court would apply strict scrutiny. So the advocate who is trying to get a law overturned will want the court to get to strict scrutiny. So LGBT rights advocates were pushing for the idea that same-sex marriage is a fundamental right. The second issue that was prominent in these cases is is there a suspect class involved? And this is for the same reason. If there's a suspect class, for example, if a statute targets people based on their race, then the courts will apply heightened scrutiny. The final issue that's been the subject of litigation is what are the state's interests? So if a state decides to ban same-sex marriage or decides not to allow same-sex couples to marry under their current law without instituting an actual ban, uh, do they have legitimate reasons for doing that? If there's no fundamental right at issue and if there's no suspect class, then we're at rational basis review and the question is simply are the state's interests legitimate? If we get to heightened scrutiny, then we'd ask if it's important or compelling instead. So each of these three areas turned out to be a crucial issue for these cases. And the arguments that litigants have made have changed over time. And the outcomes, I would have argued until yesterday, <laughs> have also changed over time. But now we see with the Sixth Circuit's opinion some of the same old arguments coming back and being resurrected. So let's start with the fundamental right. Uh, fundamental right on its, on its face looked easy. There was a 1978 case called Zabaki versus Redhale that said that marriage was a fundamental right. And so the strategy a lot of uh, LGBT rights advocates started with was there is a fundamental right to marry. We're seeking to marry. Therefore, same-sex marriage is a fundamental right. However, many courts didn't buy this argument because they thought that same-sex marriage was just not part of marriage. So the issue became definitional. It's, okay, marriage is a fundamental right, but what is marriage? And many of them turned to dictionaries. So some early cases actually got their definition out of Webster's. And the definition in Webster's Dictionary was marriage is the state of being united to a person of the opposite sex as husband or wife. Um, and, and this is the 2002 version, but it was uh, used repeatedly in the 1990s as well in a series of cases. So if that's the definition of marriage, and of course they're going to turn to the dictionary, at least early on, that meant that same-sex marriage just wasn't included in the definition, and so the fundamental rights issue is, is over. In the 2000s, in the early 2000s, as some state courts began to strike down bans on same-sex marriage, they did it by, by using a more expansive definition of marriage. So one example is the definition used by the Goodridge Court 
in uh, the in the Goodridge case by, by the Massachusetts Supreme Court in 2003. So here's their definition of marriage, the majorities. Civil marriage is at once a deeply personal commitment to another human being and a highly public celebration of the ideals of mutuality, companionship, intimacy, fidelity, and family. So no mention of gender in this definition. Instead, a focus on the personal commitment, but the public face of that personal commitment. And no turn to a dictionary, because the court was claiming that Massachusetts has its own definition of civil marriage as the state that gets to decide to extend marriage to people. Massachusetts can define marriage in any way it wants, and this is Massachusetts' definition of marriage. Incidentally, this is also a really popular reading at weddings now. Um, I've been to several weddings where there's 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, and then the reading from Goodrich, um, which is kind of a lovely juxtaposition. Um, so, um, the dissent, however, in Goodridge and in many other cases at this time, the, the majority um, would, would counter this with saying, you can't rewrite the definition of marriage. Courts shouldn't be rewriting the definition of marriage. If we're going to change it, the legislature should do that. So many courts, as they wrestled with this definitional question, uh, resorted to tradition as a justification for sticking with the dictionary definition of marriage. And one of our faculty members was the first person to really notice this trend. So a few years ago, Kim Ford Masrui, who's right over here, um, wrote a really influential law review article in which he said, tradition tends to emerge as a justification when other potential justifications are either unacceptable or unpersuasive. So that was his descriptive claim. All these courts are turning to tradition. And why are they doing it? Because they don't have any other argument. Um, and so then his normative claim was that courts should view tradition with skepticism. That should be a red flag that something is going on, maybe some discrimination is going on. Um, so over time, courts did start to do this. They started to view tradition with skepticism, although I would argue that the thing that happened more than, than viewing tradition with skepticism was simply a change in the public's understanding of what marriage was. So it's one thing to say you can't rewrite the definition of marriage if same-sex marriage is a new thing. But it's another thing to say you can't rewrite the definition of marriage when there are thousands of same-sex couples who are actually married, consider themselves married, and are legally married in a state, even if it's not your own. Um, if we think back to the early cases that use dictionary definitions and cited Webster's, if they were to do that today, this is what they would encounter. The same definition is still definition number one. But now there's a second definition in the dictionary, the state of being united to a person of the same sex in a relationship like that of a traditional marriage. So on the fundamental rights question, we saw a big shift from thinking that marriage had to be the traditional definition to an expansion of that definition so that marriage, same-sex marriage, could be included in the fundamental right to marry. But the Sixth Circuit. Sixth Circuit came back yesterday with tradition. So Professor Ford Mazuri was right. <laughs> and his article is still relevant. Uh, marriage has long been a social institution defined by relationships between men and women, so long defined the tradition is measured in millennia, not centuries, and not the decade in which I've been teaching family law. Um, so the Sixth Circuit goes back to tradition, and this argument is still live. All right, so the second, the second area. Is the suspect class implicated? <clears throat> Advocates would want to get to intermediate or strict scrutiny by claiming that bans on same-sex marriage discriminate against a group of people who's, who were considered to be a suspect class. Uh, racial discrimination is the classic example, but gender discrimination was a possible option here. So what would the argument for gender discrimination be? It would be, uh, if I'm a woman who wants to marry another woman, I'm prohibited from doing that because of my gender. If I were a man, I'd be allowed to marry her. So I'm being discriminated against because of, of gender. Now, the other possibility was sexual orientation discrimination. And the issue there, the problem there, potentially, was that the Supreme Court has never said that sexual orientation gets heightened scrutiny. So they'd be having to ask courts to make new law and to, and to add a new group of people uh, to the protected class. Opponents responded to both of these arguments with an observation that everyone, in theory, is allowed to marry. So, I can't marry another woman in some states, but I'm still allowed to marry 
It's just I have to marry a man. And with sexual orientation, if I'm a lesbian, I can marry um, a man. I just can't marry the person I'm attracted to, but I can marry someone. So no one is being prohibited from marrying. There's no gender discrimination. There's no sexual orientation discrimination. Everyone's allowed to marry. And then that gets back to the definition, right? So if you think the definition is between a man and a woman, then everybody's allowed to do that. So there's no discrimination here. Now, you might think that that argument wouldn't fly after Loving versus Virginia. So Loving versus Virginia was the 1967 Supreme Court case that struck down Virginia's anti-miscegenation law. So Virginia's law prohibited blacks from marrying whites, and the argument in favor of the law that Virginia made was exactly the same as the argument made against uh, the same-sex marriage um, argument about gender discrimination. It was blacks are allowed to marry, they just have to marry blacks. Whites are allowed to marry, they just have to marry whites. Everyone is being treated equally. Well, fortunately, back in 1966, Walter Wadlington was a family law professor here at the, at the University of Virginia, and he published an article um, eviscerating this argument in which he said that this proposition doesn't work after separate but equal has been destroyed, right? Both parties are equally punished, and both parties are allowed to marry someone of their own race, that, that if the underlying purpose of the law is to preserve white supremacy, the law is still racist. It doesn't matter that both races are being treated equally. And the Supreme Court agreed with him and cited him in Loving versus Virginia. It held that for purposes of for the Virginia statute, uh, the purpose of the Virginia statute was to perpetuate white supremacy, and it didn't matter if it applied equally to blacks and whites. So, we might think, back to the suspect class question, we might think that loving would indicate that the gender discrimination argument would be really good. It, it seems like it's, it's structurally similar to loving. And this argument has been spectacularly unsuccessful with the courts. There is no circuit court yet that has, has used the gender discrimination rationale uh, to get to intermediate scrutiny. And I'm not sure why, but I have a couple of suspicions. One is, that special roles for men and women within marriage seems affirming to people. It doesn't necessarily seem like that marriage is the purpose of marriage is to discriminate against either men and women. Um, the second is that it's not really meant to, uh, the, the bans on same sex marriage aren't really meant to maintain one gender's primacy over the other, but instead, instead to discriminate people based on their sexual orientation. So sexual orientation feels intuitively like a better fit here. So what about the sexual orientation claim? Some courts have indeed said that sexual orientation is a suspect class and got into intermediate scrutiny and struck down same-sex marriage bans using intermediate scrutiny. Um, the problem is not all states have been able to do that because in many states, in other cases, mostly military cases involving the don't ask, don't tell policy, courts had already determined that sexual orientation was not a suspect class. So then the the courts in those states or in those circuits were bound by the, the previous law, and sexual orientation is just off the table as a, as a possible rationale. So finally, the third flashpoint is what, what are the state's interests? And here it's been really interesting because the states have changed their mind, uh, minds, do they have a mind, um, about, about what their interests are over time. And there have been many interests proffered, but I wanted to focus on a couple and how I think they've morphed over, over time. So an early argument was gay people shouldn't marry and maybe even shouldn't be able to adopt or have custody of their children because they're bad parents. And this argument was a moralistic one. It was it often couched in terms of illegal behavior um, and, and the idea that, that maybe, maybe gay people would recruit their children into becoming gay too. Um, so it was, a, it was a really negative view of gay people that then was used as an excuse for, for not giving them access to, to marriage or parenting rights. By the early 2000s, this argument was gone, almost completely gone. Um, it had become, I think, politically unacceptable and socially unacceptable to make this argument. And the new argument that came up in its place was you know, gay parents are, are good. You know, in, in a second best world, if a child has lost the, his or her parents, allowing a gay couple to adopt might be a great thing. But marriage is about the first best uh, scenario. We want to encourage people to get married, to have children in the optimal way. And the optimal way is a man and a woman 
who are the biological parents of that child, raising that child. So it's not that there's anything wrong with gay people, it's just that heterosexual married couples are the best. And that became, that became the state interest asserted in a lot of these cases. The second shift happened regarding the connection between marriage and procreation. So in early cases, you saw a lot of citations to Genesis, the book of Genesis, um, talking about how the purpose of marriage is to encourage procreation, be fruitful and multiply, that kind of thing. Um, not usually a whole lot of uh, analysis about the polygamy in Genesis or other aspects of, of what marriage looked like then. Um, but the idea was we're underpopulated, we need people to procreate, we give benefits to people who marry because that means they're going to procreate. Um, this argument also began to be politically unpalatable and also just didn't respond to reality, right? 40% of children are born outside of marriage today. Um, we clearly don't need marriage to encourage procreation. Um, so the new argument that emerged in the 2000s was marriage is the institution intended to prevent accidental procreation. And this was a complete shift, especially if you think about the early arguments about gay people being bad parents and immoral. Suddenly the argument was, gay people are more responsible than heterosexual people. In order to have kids, they have to adopt or get an egg donor or a sperm donor or a surrogate. They really think hard about this decision to have kids. The heterosexual people are dangerous, right? <laughs> if, if, if they don't have marriage to, to, as a carrot, to encourage them to stick together. They're just gonna be having kids all over the place and with, not with each other. And so, so marriage is the institution that, 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 that protects us from this unruly sexuality that heterosexuals have. Um, and that's, become, that's really become the most successful argument in, in a lot of these cases, and it's one that the Sixth Circuit once again used uh, yesterday um, to, uh, in, in upholding the bans on, on same-sex marriage in, in four states. Okay. So I, I'm not the only person that has thought this, that thought that the accidental procreation argument was a little bit strange. Judge Posner, actually, this fall, in, this, in the case coming out of the Second Circuit, striking down same-sex marriage bans, was more colorful in his description of the logic. <laughs> so he says, heterosexuals get drunk and pregnant, producing unwanted children. Their reward is to be allowed to marry. Homosexual couples do not produce unwanted children. Their reward is to be denied the right to marry. Go figure. <laughs> I would never have dared to say go figure in my law review article, but, <laughs> but if you're Judge Posner, you can, you can write in the most colorful way you want to, I guess. Um, so, those are the three areas that have been, uh, where, where all the action has been in, in, these, in these cases. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, how these have, uh, played out in the, in the very recent cases that came down since the Windsor decision. So we've had four circuits, uh, the fourth, the tenth, the seventh, the seventh was Judge Posner was there, and the ninth that have struck down their same-sex marriage bans, and then we had the sixth circuit who just upheld them. Um, I'll go back to that in a minute. Um, the fourth circuit used a fundamental right analysis in order to uh, strike down the ban. This was Virginia's uh, constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. Uh, they did this partly, I think, because sexual orientation discrimination was not available for the reasons I said before. Uh, there was already Fourth Circuit law saying that that doesn't get heightened scrutiny. So we've got one circuit where marriage is same-sex marriage is a fundamental right, but it's not a discrimination case. The Tenth Circuit did exactly the same thing for the same reasons. The Seventh Circuit, Judge Posner, who I just showed you, based his opinion on sexual orientation discrimination, he did not do a traditional analysis of the, is this a suspect class, you know, is it a discrete and, and insular minority, is it immutable, or this, is this group politically powerless, therefore do we, we get to intermediate scrutiny. He made up his own four-part test that's kind of a law and economics balancing test, and then ended up in the same place. And then there's a paragraph towards the end of the opinion that says, if you want your traditional analysis, here's how it works, this intermediate scrutiny. Um, but that's basically where he ends up, but with his own, his own test. And then the Ninth Circuit also based their opinion on sexual orientation discrimination, although Judge Reinhardt, who wrote the majority opinion, then concurred to his own majority opinion to say that he also would find that marriage is a fundamental right. And then Judge Berzon added her concurrence that she would also find that 
you should get heightened scrutiny because of gender discrimination. Um, so that's where we are in terms of the four circuits uh, before yesterday. And I think it matters. Like, I, I, you know, they, they've come out with the same result, but ultimately the, the circuits in which the, the, the marriage cases have been decided based on the fundamental rights analysis are confined, are confined to marriage. It marriage is this special institution that's so fundamental that you can't keep people out of it. In the other circuits where it's been a sexual orientation uh, a discrimination kind of uh, rationale, it's quite likely, I think, that these cases will then be applicable far beyond the marriage context, right? So even though I think the press has reported this as the circuits are unified, there's no circuit split, there's no problem, um, I think actually the underlying rationale of the cases matters tremendously in what's going to happen down the road with LGBT rights litigation in general. So what will the Supreme Court do now that the Sixth Circuit has been the first one to come in and say no on both of these rationales? Um, I don't like to predict things, but I would like to say a couple things about the Windsor case and what I think might happen with the Supreme Court. So when Justice Kennedy wrote his opinion uh, just a little over a year ago, really, in Windsor, this was the case striking down the Defense of Marriage Act, it was really uh, notable, I think, that none of these three issues was fully addressed by the decision. Um, so. We don't know how the Supreme Court would address any of these issues. Uh, he did not find that the Defense of Marriage Act violated a fundamental right. Uh, he did not find that sexual orientation or gender were suspect classes that would lead to, to heightened scrutiny. Um, he did address the legitimate state interests issue, but he did so by finding Congress's reason impermissible. So he said that the Congress's uh, aim in passing the Defense of Marriage Act was a bare desire to harm a politically unpopular group. Um, so that suggests it's a kind of rational basis review or rational basis review with bite. And it just doesn't fit this traditional constitutional analysis that all the other courts are doing. I think it's fascinating that the courts have all rejected his framework. Like you would think that when the Supreme Court sets forth a model for how they think that constitutional adjudication should be handled, that the circuit courts might copy that. Um, but I think the model seemed to be such a one-off uh, example that there wasn't really a model to copy, and they've all reverted to this strict scrutiny, rational basis review, um, how do you get from one to the other um, approach. And so we just don't know how, how Justice Kennedy would, would decide this case. Um, so what will happen? Um, here, I'll, I'll make my predictions, and I'll probably be wrong on some of these. But I think now that the Sixth Circuit has weighed in, the Supreme Court is probably going to have to take either that case or one of them. The Fifth Circuit is uh, hearing oral argument in January. The Eleventh Circuit has a case coming up. It might not be the Sixth Circuit case, but I think it'll be one of them. I think Justice Kennedy is likely to write the opinion. Um, he'll be the senior justice if, if he decides to strike down bans on same-sex marriage, which I'm assuming after Windsor he probably would, but I don't know. I think his opinion probably won't use the frameworks that I've been talking about, like he did in Romer and Lawrence. Uh, so Romer was the Colorado Amendment 2 case, Lawrence versus Texas was the Texas sodomy statute case, and then Windsor. Um, I bet that he will decide this using a non-traditional kind of constitutional analysis. And so It'll give clarity on the question of marriage equality nationwide, but I don't think it will give clarity on those other questions about whether sexual orientation discrimination is impermissible outside of the context of marriage. So although my life has been very exciting for the last 10 years in family law, the people whose lives may be really exciting going forward might be the people who do housing or employment or other areas of law in which LGBT people are likely to be bringing claims regardless of what the Supreme Court does. Um, thank you.